it is best described as a jar and a grinding sound. No one was very much alarmed, but we knew we had hit something. It seemed that the boat had stopped. My husband came into the room and said, we are in the north and have struck an iceberg. I said, I know we have struck something. Then Boxall said, the water is up to F deck in the mail room. He had no need to say anything further then. My father-in-law was in the same room. He ran up on deck and back at once with a large lump of ice. He threw it on my bunk and told me to get up. At that moment, a messenger from the bridge told us to put on our warmest clothes and muster in the mess room, and as a precaution, to put on our life belts. I met the chief officer almost immediately after coming out of the door of the quarters. He told me to commence to take the covers off the boats. The captain had ordered all ladies on deck. That frightened me a little, but after being reassured there was no danger, I took plenty of time in dressing, putting on all my heavy clothing, high shoes and two coats, as well as a warm knit hood. A lady and two gents were near to me, and I heard them say, she can't possibly sink. She's got so many airtight compartments. I lowered number four down onto A deck and then gave orders for the women and children to go down to A deck to be loaded through the windows. My husband kissed me goodbye and placed me in the lifeboat with the assistance of an officer. As the small boat was lowered, he yelled from the deck, keep your hands in your pockets, it is very cold weather. There were 24 people in our boat. They are supposed to hold 50. All the boats were gone by now, except number nine. There was a bit of trouble there. The first officer was threatening someone and fired two revolver shots and he was shouting, now will you get back? I wasn't near enough to see if anyone was shot. She seemed to take a bit of a dive. A man, just in front of me, jumped overboard. And I, without a fault, did the same. The water was intensely cold. It felt like a thousand knives driven into my body. One's natural instinct was to try to get out of it. And I was swimming out towards the head of the ship. Of course, I soon realized this was rather foolish. So I turned back to swim across, clear of the ship to starboard. All around there was terrible screaming. I plainly heard someone screaming, save one life. I've never forgotten that. From there, I was sucked in again. I came up alongside an overturned boat. Some of the men were clinging to it. I was drawn by 25 to 30 others. We were some distance away when the Titanic went down. We watched with sorrow and heard the many cries for help and pitied the captain because we knew he would have to stay with his ship. The cries we heard, I thought, were seamen or possibly steerage who had overslept, it not occurring to me for a moment that my husband and my friends were not saved. We took on board all that we could. I think there were three or four died in the night. There was one man quite near to us. He had the voice of authority. He was cheering us with, good boy, good lads. I reached out the oar to try and help him. But it was too far gone. When it touched him, he turned around like a cork and was silent. I saw the Carpathia come on the scene about 4 a.m. They took us off at daybreak by one of our own boats. 
They were kindness itself, to each and every one of us, regardless of position. I counted 65 heads, not including myself and any that were in the bottom of the boat. I roughly estimated 75 in the boat. 